Um, but I'm very excited. I'm thrilled about today's um, speaker and presentation who uh, will be not a stranger to any of you and is a legend at Emory and to properly introduce her. Uh, I want to turn the podium to Dr. Rebecca Lovett. Thank you. Um, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Rebecca Levitt. I know some of you, many of you, and I am a, an assistant professor in the Division of Cardiology. Um, but it is really my great honor to be here to introduce Dr. Nanette Wanger, who is a professor in the Division of Cardiology. And I will say that but it is very difficult to introduce Dr. Wenger, um, partially because she is so accomplished, but mostly because I fear she hates uh, hearing about herself. <laughs> so I will do, I don't know, my very best. Um, I'll keep it very short. Um, but she graduated from Hunter College, went on to do her medical education at Harvard Medical School, and then residency, and I think an informal fellowship at Mount Sinai uh, in New York. And uh, luckily, she was recruited um, to come down to Atlanta and begin her career at Grady. Um, along the way, she has won an incredible number of, war of awards, which I could not begin to list here but I did pick um, some favorites out of the list that I saw on her CV, um, including being named the Georgia Woman of the Year in 2010, winning the highest awards from the American Heart Association, including the Golden Heart Award, and being invited to present the James B. Herrick Lecture in 2011, and has also been honored by giving the Simon Dac keynote lecture at the American College of Cardiology recently in 2018. Um, she has been featured in the National Library of Medicine Expo exposition on uh, the changing faces of medicine in the history of American women physicians, and was also invited to give a lecture during the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute's 70th anniversary party, um, and just as an example of how well she's regarded both nationally and internationally. Uh, so Dr. Wenger, um, thank you for being such a great mentor and leader in our division and uh, in this country and also internationally. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing about your thoughts on understanding the journey, the past, present and future of cardiovascular disease in women and maybe other topics as well. Thank you very much uh, for the very wonderful introduction. And it is a delight to be here and to be invited to speak at Medicine Grand Rounds. Rather than, as was requested, talking about me and my story, I thought I would just review understanding the journey, the past, present, and future of cardiovascular disease in women because in part, this has been my academic journey. Next. Next slide. These are my disclosures and there is no conflict with what I'm about to present. Next. But this is essentially the message that there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Obviously, when Victor Hugo did this, this was in the context of the French Revolution. I'm doing this in the context of heart disease in women. Because for most of the past century, heart disease was considered a problem for men. And only over time has it become part of the medical parlance that the female heart is vulnerable to heart disease. And I thought to carry you on the journey with me. Next. And this cartoon, I think, is a wonderful introduction to the topic. The year of the cartoon is 1991, and we see the physician saying to the woman across the desk, we have studies of fruit flies, mice, hamsters, frogs, monkeys, and men with this condition. But medical research using women as subjects just never occurred to anybody. Well, fortunately it did, next. next. And the results are stunning because when we examine cardiovascular disease mortality, here we see the men in the solid line, the women in the dotted line, 
we realized that through the last century, all of the decline in cardiovascular mortality was in populations of men. Next slide, please. And this is one of my favorite slides, the women in red, the uh, men in the blue. And you see that about beginning in 2000, when we had sex-specific data, there was an abrupt decline in cardiovascular mortality in women, much more abrupt than that for men. And about 2012, 2013, for the first time, fewer women than men died of cardiovascular disease each year. And as I've said on other platforms, we are delighted to be in second place and we hope to stay there. Next. But let me show you where this started. And this is a slide given to me by the Oregon Heart Association. Uh, you see the date is 1964. And it was called coronary heart disease, but heart disease in women. But the title was Hearts and Husbands. And the women were simply told how to protect their husbands from heart disease. Next. When the American Heart Association introduced the prudent diet to the American public, what was it called? It was called the way to a man's heart. Obviously, these were the people who had the heart disease. Next. And a number of years later, this is 1977, when Dr. Harriet Dustin and I began to do television programs on women's vulnerability to heart disease, look at the caption on the bottom. This was presented at 11 p.m. on primetime TV. And we were the late night show rather than it being presented in the middle of the day as it is today. Next. And what I want to do is to carry you through with the steps on the journey. And I think it began in 1992 with the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute Conference on Cardiovascular Health and Disease in Women. Uh, it followed a 1986 workshop. Note the long delay between the workshop and the conference, very unusual. And it was my privilege to co-chair this conference. And we emphasized the flawed assumption that women didn't experience heart disease until they were elderly, and that they were not as seriously at risk as were men. We highlighted the new information that was appropriate for clinical application, and we identified the knowledge gaps. And that identification of knowledge gaps in that New England Journal paper really began the investigation into cardiovascular disease in women. As a matter of fact, that New England Journal paper, I think was the first time a major journal had coupled the terms of women and heart disease. Next. Fast forward to 2001, the Institute of Medicine report, very important, called Exploring the Biological Contributions to Human Health, Does Sex Matter? And the identification was that there was a need to evaluate sex-based differences in human disease and in medical research, but importantly, to translate these differences into clinical practice, because everything that we do is really translated into our improvement of care for the patient. Next. As background to the slide, you have to realize that one of the reasons that women were not studied in terms of disease was simply that they were thought to be protected from all illnesses premenopausally by their intrinsic hormones and subsequently by menopausal hormone therapy. This has been called the greatest uninformed trial that was ever conducted in populations of women in the US. But all of the beneficial data came from observational studies. And then we had the randomized trials. And Emory was a very prominent participant in these randomized trials. First, the heart and estrogen progestin replacement study in women with heart disease, and then the Women's Health Initiative in Healthy Women. And what we found was that menopausal hormone therapy did not prevent incident or recurrent cardiovascular disease and was not indicated for the primary or secondary prevention. And what these studies did 
was to refocus attention on the established cardiovascular preventive therapies for women. Next. Then just a few years later, we had a report on the diagnosis and treatment of coronary disease in women. And this was a systematic review of the research. And it was damning because it said that the contemporary recommendations for prevention, diagnostic testing, medical and surgical treatments of cardiovascular disease in women were extrapolated from studies conducted predominantly in middle-aged men, and as a matter of fact, in middle-aged Caucasian men, and that there were fundamental knowledge gaps regarding the biology, the clinical manifestations, and the optimal management strategies for women. Again, a challenge to the research community. Next. I want to emphasize the importance of advocacy in terms of public awareness. And it was a number of years ago, 2004, that the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute instituted the Heart Truth Campaign, basically saying heart disease doesn't care what you wear, next slide. And following that, the American Heart Associations go red for women. And essentially that established the red dress of the icon for women and heart disease, next. And also Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease, because it is these advocacy organizations that brought the parlance of women and heart disease to the general public. Next. Let's examine just a few of the studies, and I've highlighted a few of them. One is the Women's Health Study, uh, looking at aspirin and found that aspirin prevented stroke, but not incident myocardial infarction in women. And this was totally different from the physician's health study where aspirin provided protection against myocardial infarction, but not stroke. Just emphasis that you could not extrapolate data from men to data for women. Next. Very interesting data from a quality improvement registry. And Crusade looked at women with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And what they found was that the ACS prognosis was worse for women than for men. They had an excess of hospital death, myocardial infarction, heart failure, stroke, requirement for transfusion. And despite their high risk status, they were less likely to receive coronary interventions, less likely to receive guideline-based medical therapies. And uh, we raised the question as to whether their worst prognosis was related to a raised baseline risk or suboptimal admission and discharge therapies. And I raised the question, was this biology bias or both? And I expect it was both. Next. Next. Then this landmark study, the NHLBI's Women Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation or the WISE study. Now to be enrolled in the WISE study, women had to have evidence of myocardial ischemia on non-invasive testing. They then had coronary arteriography. And amazingly, a sizable number of these women with unquestionable myocardial ischemia on non-invasive testing did not have obstructive disease of the epicardial coronary arteries. At that point in time, the clinical community shrugged its shoulders and said false positive non-invasive tests. Well, that's a phrase that you must remove from your vocabulary. This was not a false positive non-invasive test there was myocardial ischemia. It was simply that it was not related to obstructive disease of the epicardial coronary arteries. And because these women were in a study, they were followed. And it was found that they had evidence of hard events, myocardial infarction, cardiovascular death. And that established the principle that myocardial ischemia was the villain. It was associated with adverse clinical outcomes even in the absence of obstructive coronary disease, it now raised the vision of microvascular disease and the importance of non-obstructive coronary disease in women, both associated with myocardial ischemia 
and both be very actively under study today. Next. Then there were a number of other studies, uh, mostly by the Boston group the women's antioxidant cardiovascular study and the antioxidant and folic acid study. And this was a time when vitamin E, C, and beta carotene were used very widely as preventive therapies. And this study showed that they didn't prevent incident or recurrent cardiovascular disease in women. And the same with the folic acid and vitamin D supplements. And what this did was to remove ineffective therapies from the recommended preventive regimens. And I will tell you, it was so difficult for me to get the patients that I saw in my clinic, the women off their vitamin C, their vitamin E, and their vitamin B supplements, simply because these were natural products. But we said, you know, they're likely not to do you harm but they are ineffective therapies and they often were used rather than the guideline-based medical therapies. Very, very important step. Next. Then a fascinating study by Hani Jnayo from the Get With The Guidelines database. And what the database showed us is that women had a doubled STEMI mortality compared with men. You see the numbers here but this was predominantly in the initial 24 hours. And it was associated with the fact that they did not receive early aspirin, beta blockers, reperfusion therapy, or time reperfusion. It's not that the physician said, I'm not going to treat my female patients as well as my male patients. It's simply that these women had unrecognized STEMI and therefore did not receive the early life-saving therapy. And this taught us about the opportunities to lessen gender disparities in care and to improve clinical outcomes. Next. Then again, the Institute of Medicine, which has done some just landmark work. And in 2010, just a decade ago, they reported on women's health research, the progress, the pitfalls, and the promise. And they highlighted that medical research has historically neglected the health needs of women. And this is what I call bikini medicine, meaning the only areas that were studied in research in women were the areas covered by the bikini bathing suit, the breasts and the reproductive system. The rest of the woman, it was assumed the data from men could be extrapolated. And the Institute of Medicine identified for women's health the sex differences, which are the biologic factors, and the gender differences, which we speak of so much today, those that are affected by broader social, environmental, and community factors. The IOM acknowledged that there was major progress in reducing cardiovascular mortality. I've shown you that graph. But emphasized the need for greater research attention to quality of life issues, to function, to mobility, to wellness. Next. And next. And further from this, and these are very important items. The IOM emphasized that women are not a homogeneous group and their disparities in disease burden among subgroups of women, women who are socially disadvantaged by race, ethnicity, income, education, and advocated targeted research on these subsets of women with the highest risks, the highest burdens of disease. We have seen so much during this COVID epidemic on the social determinants of health. But that's a, this was uh, done a decade ago, and we've just seen some of this come to light once again today. But the IOM also told us that there was a lack of analysis and reporting of sex stratified analyses. And because of that, we couldn't identify potentially important sex and gender differences, including differences in care. And they challenged us as journal editors to require that clinical trial outcomes be presented separately for women and for men. They advocated translation of women's health research findings into clinical practice and public health policies and communication of these messages to women, to the public, 
to providers as we are doing today and to policymakers. Next. Then in 2011, we had an update of the Women's Cardiovascular Prevention Guidelines. And here were highlighted several items that I think in 2020 we take for granted. And that is that pregnancy complications, particularly preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, preterm delivery, that all of these are early indicators of an increase in cardiovascular risk. It's not likely that they cause the risk, but they are shared risk factors. And that emphasizes that a detailed history of pregnancy complications should be a routine component of risk assessment for women. And we often see separation of the OB history and the general medical history. And I tell my women patients, bring your OB history to your primary care provider. That's part of your story. And also it highlighted the increased risk with systemic autoimmune collagen vascular disease, meaning that these women should be screened for coronary risk factors. Next. For the classicists, you will remember the story of Sisyphus who pushes that boulder up the hill only to have it roll down again. And that for some time was the story of women and heart disease. But I think we have gotten some contemporary help for Sisyphus that I want to outline for you next. And first as background, we have to examine the data on women in clinical trials. They were underrepresented in the mixed gender NIH trials. And even when they were represented, it was not gender specific analysis. Women in clinical trials increased over time, but you can see that during the uh, end of the last century, only 20% of the acute coronary syndrome study population were women, although women had half of the events. There's a very elegant Cochrane review of some 250 cardiovascular clinical trials, and they found that only a third of them examine the outcomes by sex. And among those trials that had sex-based analysis, 20%, one in five, reported significant difference in outcome between women and men. And I want to highlight from us that the exclusion of elderly patients from clinical trials really doubly disadvantages women because many women have a predominance of their coronary events at older age. Next. Next. No, oh, you've missed the slide. Go back. You've missed, you've missed some slides. You missed. Go back. Go back. Wait. Okay. Ne next. Now, this shows that our Congress can work effectively. And this is HR 2101, the Research for All Act of 2015. And what this was, was a mandate by the Government Accountability Office to update the reports on women and minority inclusion in medical research, both at the NIH and the FDA. For the NIH, it was mandated. Previously, there were recommendations and guidance, but this was legislation to ensure that both male and female cells, tissues, or animals be included in basic research and the results disaggregated according to sex and sex differences. Amazingly, asking many of the basic scientists, were the cells they were studying, were the tissues they were studying, what was their provenance? Were they derived from male or female animals? And there was no information available. So that often we were studying female disease on cells and tissues from male animals. And the NIH had to update the guidelines on the inclusion of women and minorities in clinical research. And I think you know that as you submit now your studies to the study section, that if you don't have the gender inclusion and the minority inclusion, that automatically will, will be triaged. That took a lot of education of the study sections, of the investigators, and uh, of the staff at the NIH. Then they directed the, the FDA, but didn't mandate them directed them to ensure that 
drug trials for expedited drug approve, uh, approval be sufficient to determine safety and effectiveness for both women and men. And that had to be supported by results of trials that separately examine the outcomes for women. Next, and something that came out just within the last few weeks. But notice, this is not legislation. This is not a mandate. This is simply guidance, and that doesn't work. In the past decades, the FDA did try to advocate for clinical trials that better reflected the population likely to use the drug by broadening the eligibility criteria. But there was no question that certain groups continue to be underrepresented in many clinical trials. And here was the guidance that recommended that the sponsors, industry of clinical trials, for drug application and for new biologic license application, try to increase the enrollment of underrepresented populations. This is step one, but it's a baby step because it is simply guidance and recommendation. What we need is the same mandate that is now in operation at, at the NIH. Next. What I want to do is to give you my vision of where I think cardiovascular health research has to go. Because heart disease in women is not solely a medical issue. And I expect that for people who want to contribute to the landscape of women's cardiovascular health research, we will have to examine beliefs and behaviors. We'll have to examine data from the community local, national, and global. Economic issues, as we saw in COVID, enormously important, environmental, very important ethical issues. And then as we've seen, legislative, political, public policy, societal, sociocultural, this is a huge spectrum that will involve a huge spectrum of research scientists, basic and clinical, Next. Next. And this is why I think it is important to examine gender differences in coronary heart disease. I thank you for your attention and let me address any concerns that Dr. Levitt or any of you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wanger. Um, Myself and Dr. Armstrong are going to be monitoring the chat box. So we would really encourage anyone who has questions or comments or something to discuss to please go ahead and write it in the chat box. Um, but I guess to start us off, um, there were a couple kind of thoughts that I had as you were talking. And one of them was, you know, at the beginning of your career, when you started, you know, practicing at Grady, how did that influence or allow you to kind of see that problem that no one else was really focusing on that women's heart disease was being treated the same as men? I mean, it's so obvious now when you bring it up and we've been trained to be aware of this, but at that time, nobody was really aware of it. Um, so do you have any thoughts on that? I was seeing women patients in the clinic. I was seeing women patients on the ward and they had disease and they had serious disease. And when I went to the literature, all of the data that were available were derived from studies in middle-aged white men. And that was assumed to be the model for disease. And I saw these women were very sick. They were not having favorable outcomes. And I spent a great deal of time trying to talk to the American Heart Association, the very new then American College of Cardiology, and it was the National Heart Institute. It had not yet become the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and saying, we really need to do this. And it took a number of years until finally, uh, it was now the NHLBI started the workshop and the conference, and brought to the forefront this question. And I expect my major contribution was raising the issue 
that we had no knowledge and identifying the knowledge gaps. And I think many of you who work with me know that my leadership concept is not a top down, but a bottom up. And what I want to do is essentially try to enroll people in my vision and then let them fly. And I think this is what has happened with heart disease in women. People saw the problem and they just spread their wings and began to garner data. So one point that's kind of come up in the chat box is that um, many women are deriving a lot of their, their primary care from OBGYN. And that sometimes I've seen in my practice at least that you know, women with increased risk, say preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, aren't aware of that risk, uh, maybe until after it's too late. Clearly, there's more work that we could be doing. Um, what do you see as sort of the places where there's still gaps um, that we need to start to close? Well, the, there is a scientific statement that came out of the American Heart Association about two years ago and both by the head of uh, ACOG and uh, of American Heart, saying that there must be more cooperation with the OBGYNs. Because for many healthy women, the OBGYNs are their primary care physicians. But remember, the OBGYN community is very invested in prevention, mammograms, pap smears, et cetera. And the education should be that the women's greatest risk is cardiovascular disease and conventional coronary risk factors should be ascertained for all the women in this primary care setting, but particularly the women who have the complications of pregnancy, that's a high risk group. And the Emory Women's Heart Center is now involved with the preeclampsia follow-up clinic so that uh, these women meet the cardiologists uh, are told that they have a problem, are suggested the preventive measures so that the cardiologist is not a stranger. Now, one of the things that Georgia has done extremely well is as you know, previously Medicaid was just for the six weeks postpartum. Now it, it has been extended to the year postpartum. Extended and funded so our Georgia legislature can do well when they need to. And uh, this means that we have the ability to follow these women for the first year. And often in reproductive age women for the first year after a complication of pregnancy, they will develop risk factors and events. So this is a very high risk subset and everyone has to pay attention to them. And again, uh, with the maternal mortality being so high in Georgia, we have to identify so that so much of this is a cardiovascular mortality. Yeah, there's a lot of kind of links between your story with heart disease in women and sort of the some of the issues that have come up with the COVID pandemic. Um, I'm sort of kind of scrolling through the chat box and Wendy, if you have any questions that you think we should answer, um, please feel free to jump in. Um, one thing that Dr. Sperling has brought up is two principles of fortitude and resilience, both professionally and personally. Um, do you have any words of wisdom about how we could apply that to our practices, our personal lives in this stressful time, and also how to help our patients who may be struggling? Well, remember that we really have a sacred profession. We are caring for the lives of our patients. And I think that for those of us who see patients in the clinics and on the wards, there almost is not a day that goes by that we can't at the end of the day that we had say that we have contributed something to the good of the world. And that's not something that occurs very often in many other areas of work and of endeavor. So there's almost instant feedback in the patients that we see. 
And I think that is what gives us resilience. But I think in, in our clinical care or in our work, we have to have a passion for what we do. We have to think that what we are doing is important enough for us to devote our attention to it and to continue to advocate for it. And this, I think, is the basis for resilience and the fact that we continue to accomplish should help lessen the burnout. Dr. Del Rio, do you want to unmute and ask the question that you texted in? Sure, happy to do that. Uh, Nanette, that was just a beautiful presentation. I'm always amazed about how you continue driving and how you continue advancing science. And I was just very moved by that essay you recently wrote about your thoughts and your role in, in the COVID pandemic. And tell us, I want to hear a little bit about, you know, when all this started, how do you, how did you cope with it? How did you, what are your thoughts about the COVID epidemic? Well, I think that the several of us who wrote that piece uh, were concerned. Uh, I think we saw the reason we were quarantined, but from essentially from March through June, I was working from home. And uh, certainly there was something that I could do from home, but I was concerned that I couldn't take care of patients. And my prejudice was that I possibly could take care of some of these patients better than even that, or as well as some of the people who were. But I saw the reason for the quarantine. Uh, I obeyed it. But what many of us did was through the American College of Cardiology and the other organizations, we spent a huge amount of time lobbying CMS to allow reimbursement for telehealth. And you know, when all of us talked about telehealth in the past, we were told it would take years, it would never happen, et cetera. It's amazing what payment does. And once the payment happened, the telehealth that in other settings might have taken months to years essentially occurred overnight. And we saw this here at a public hospital in Center City, and we saw that we could do it, that it was effective, that we could care for patients. And you know, as I look at television now and look at the ads for Medicare, what they're advertising is that under some of these Advantage plans, patients now have an increased access to telehealth, which shows that this is something that's now valued by the community. And you know, Carlos, uh, we will not ever practice medicine or do clinical research in the same way after COVID. We learned a number of things that where we go from snail's pace to warp speed and some of the things will stay. Some of the things we've done well, some of the things we've done poorly, but we have learned how to take better care of patients. We've learned what patients value. We've learned importantly, the social determinants of health. And hopefully that is going to guide some of the health policy for our nation. So not to 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 turn uh, to keep it with COVID, but and not turn too far away, but a little bit back to cardiology. I don't know, Dr. Stevens, if you're in a spot where you can unmute and ask your question. Otherwise, I'll read it. Hi, Nanette. Uh, thank you for a, a great talk and for decades of leadership in this uh, in this space. Uh, we really appreciate your contributions. And I, my question really is about uh, COVID and the heart and uh, uh, in particular about long haulers. And have you thought about this or you have any thoughts about this in regards to women and, and the long hauler syndrome associated with COVID as it relates to uh, the heart? Well, I don't think we have the data. And I think that's the first step is to get the data. We've seen that women don't have as severe outcomes as men. The differences aren't huge, but they are unquestionably present. But what we don't have yet, and what we're really dependent on our epidemiology colleagues to define for us is that, is this all women and all men? Does it relate to racial ethnic minorities? Does it differ? 
Is it different with young women, older women? Uh, does it relate to pre-existing conditions? So that before we identify the population at risk, we really need this information. And of course, we're calling this long haulers. But what are the data that we have? We have months of data. We don't even have a full year of data. And we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know whether any of this will appear later on. I'm very concerned with the young students who are getting disease, who seem to do well in the short term. But look at their chest x-rays. That's not benign. Does it stay? We're, we're really going to look, have to look almost organ system by organ system to see what is going on. And what we learned is that if the research question is properly formulated, and if it's narrow enough, and that, that's what the question has been with the COVID and the drugs and the vaccines, it's been focused and narrow and well-funded. We, this is the way we will get the answers. But I, I, I don't think we have the slightest idea about what this long haul is, whether there are sex and gender differences and what they are. And this, I think, is going to be a very, very important area. And then we will have to talk to our insurers. Is COVID a pre-existing condition? If COVID is a pre-existing condition, a sizable proportion of the US has a pre-existing condition. How will governmental insurance and private insurance treat this? Very important. That's a great argument for coverage of pre-existing conditions. Um, Dr. Farley, are you where you can unmute? Um, uh... I am. Um, hey, Nanette. Hello. Um, okay. Enjoyed your talk. Um, I, I kind of wanted just to take a step back and have you just um, reflect on your career, having been, you know, one of very few women cardiologists at the early phase of your career and just lessons you've learned about being a woman in medicine, particularly in the specialty of cardiology. Well, I expect that some of my ease with doing this related to my experience in medical school because my classmates were very supportive. I had a wonderful four years at medical school and both through medical school and my residency training, I had fabulous mentors who essentially were gender blind. And when I came to the Emory University School of Medicine, Willis Hurst, who was my chief, essentially was gender blind. Those of you who remember Willis's days, his emphasis was a quest for excellence, and it was a matter of quality and data, et cetera. And that, that essentially was the issue. But Monica, you have to remember that I think probably the reason that gender never became an issue is that I earned my spurs early on uh, in the civil rights arena. Remember that I came from the North. I was one of those damn Yankees who came and never went back. And uh, I came to a strictly segregated hospital. And in the clinic where I was in charge, the white patients were called Mr. or Mrs. and the black patients were called by their first name. And you know, we all have our core values that are based on the way we were raised, that are based on our faith. And I said, this cannot happen. And in my clinic, everyone was called Mr. or Mrs. And you can imagine, I was down in the director's office of the hospital for breaking the hospital rules and regulations and breaking what was tradition. And uh, we agreed to disagree and it continued to happen. And uh, the rest of it is, is part history. And some of the other things that I did early on, some of you may not realize that there was the tacit assumption that poverty was associated with a lack of intelligence and information. And when I came to Grady, patients had their prescriptions by number. You went to the pharmacy and got number sevens, number 11, number what have you. Well, of course, I had to learn these numbers immediately when I came there. And I said to the pharmacist, this is ridiculous. Well, it didn't work. I sent a note 
And probably inadvertently, I started one of the first patient education programs because in my clinic, we gave out little cards that said number five, our digitalis. This is your heart pill, number whatever it was. And we did this. And it took about four or five years until patients received their prescription by name. And I think that the battles that I fought were prominent and I think appreciated by many of my colleagues so that the gender differences uh, were not an issue. And uh, I never really experienced either subtle or major gender discrimination in what was done simply because I came here with a very high level of education and information and I earned my spurs. Can I ask a follow-up to that? If you didn't feel a lot of gender discrimination in your immediate workplace, how about as you were advocating for studies of women in cardiology from the greater research community then that you've described some of in your talk? Oh, they, they, they just shrugged their shoulders and said it was not important. And some of the very prestigious researchers in heart disease, whom I will not name, just said, women are too complicated, we're not gonna put them in the clinical trials. So the coronary drug project, my first NIH grant was all men and a number of the others were. And I, my hand went up every time in terms of saying, well, how do we extrapolate this to women? And sooner or later, a number of people, as I said, became enrolled in my vision and began to ask the questions, but search for the answers. It's not just asking the questions, it's the search for the answers. Dr. Manning, you uh, texted me a question. Do you want to unmute and ask it? Hi, Dr. Wanger. Thank you so much oh. for that talk. Um, I want to know um, if you could tell us, or if you could just reflect for a moment and share with us the proudest achievement of your career. The proudest achievement of my career is really uh, my family, because uh, we were. My husband was, was faculty at, at the Emory University School of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology. We had three daughters. And this was a time when women did not work unless they had to work. And uh, the fact that I was able to successfully raise three very wonderful daughters and that they all went on to become professional women and leaders in what they do uh, essentially validated my decision to be a working mom. So I think that just being able to incorporate in my family life what I did in my professional life is probably one of the most important things that I've done. Bravo. Yes, I love that answer. Um, Dr. Afotokan, are you able to unmute? No, we are. Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wenga. Um, it's uh, for such an excellent uh, uh, lecture, and it's been a pleasure working closely with you over the past few years on the number of efforts uh, that we have uh, uh, collaborated on. Um, and, and I just wanted to ask you. Uh, to just comment briefly on what can be done to really increase awareness about uh, women's health in medical education at all levels, from the medical school level to residency, fellowship, and continuous uh, medical education. Well, Emory is in a unique position, having the Birch Grant and having the SCORE Grant and now emphasizing uh, the importance of sex and gender differences. We have to go back to our curriculum committee and there are a number of examples across the country where sex and gender differences are standard incorporation in the curriculum, not a little footnote, and that has to happen. But 
my vision is that this extends across the university. Because remember what I said in my presentation, that women's health is not solely a medical issue. And therefore, I would hope that sex and gender differences are addressed in the law school, that they're addressed in the business school, certainly in the theology group. And if we see this as a concept throughout the university, this is an academic concept, then I expect we will advance the field very, very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wenger, I just have to let you know that your answer about your proudest achievement has now got my text messages buzzing from many people, many women in medicine who feel particularly gratified, I think, by your answer. I think I've had five people text me in the last minute um, in response. And so thank you so much um, for that. How do you, where do you see things headed in the future with respect to women in medicine and women's issues in research. Um, you've given us like such a, a tremendous story to me, one of the things I take home from this of the power of advocacy and of speaking out when you see something that needs to be righted in many avenues in your life, both your stories at Grady and also getting women included in research and so on. Do you think it's, you know, it, that fight is over and that we're set now that uh, this is accepted, uh, an accepted part of, of, uh, of inquiry and study? Remember, I titled this Steps on the Journey. Yeah. And what I've done is to outline the first steps that we've taken. And obviously there is much that remains to be done. You know, what did your children always ask you? Are we there yet? No, we are not there yet. But I think we have, we built a concept that people will listen to, and we simply have to expand it. But in the weeks and months to come, we will have to look in our local community, in our state, and nationally to see that all of the things that happen in terms of public policy and governmental decisions do not disadvantage women. Uh, it's, it's been a hundred years since we got the vote. And uh, many things have happened over that hundred years. But uh, just as the vote is not complete, the women's health issue is not complete. And I want to see that across all specialties and across all areas. Uh, but we should not forget that advocacy is really important. I've said to many of my colleagues, we're privileged, all of us here on this call, we're privileged because of our background, because of our education, because of our colleagues. And when you come from a position of privilege, you have to give back. And advocacy is the first step in giving back. And then it's a matter of following what you say with what you do. I, I sort of had another question, but boy, that seems like a really perfect spot to, to, to start to draw things to a close. Dr. Levitt, did you have uh, any anything in closing you wanted to say? No, I just, I, I love all these um, different questions from different places. And um, I guess, if I could end with one more question, it would be Dr. Wenger, what is like one practical thing that we could all do to actually fulfill that, to advocate for our patients or our colleagues? Um, I know many of us have been troubled by disparities and health disparities and disparities in terms of the makeup of our colleagues um, wanting to improve that. Well, you know, one of the things that I've heard from many people is that silence is complicity. And what we have to realize is that if we see something that needs remediation, then it is our responsibility first to speak up, to identify it, and then to work to see if it can be remedied. But I am very concerned that many people who see a problem essentially don't follow through. 
And we are the people who have the voice. We have our various pulpits. And because we have the voice, we have the responsibility to speak up. Well, thank you. That um, is, um, is, I think, a perfect um, message, um, you know, with great, you know, power comes great responsibility or something. I'm paraphrasing that, but uh, I, I think that that is true of what we have as physicians. And I am so grateful to your living example to show us a roadmap and blueprint of how um, we can all strive to be better. Thank you for the invitation. Medical Grand Rounds is something very special to me. Everyone have a good day. You too. Thank you.